All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to our Bible study at Sir Nord Calvary Baptist Church. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, get started and open up with a word of prayer. Go ahead, uh, Brother Earl, please. Thank you. Almighty God, we just want to give you thanks, Lord, for sparing us, uh, bringing us together once more to our Bible study. Lord, we ask that you just continue to bless this group and bless those who will listen to us tonight and even thereafter. Lord, we ask that you will guide us, that your Holy Spirit will just guide us, guide our thoughts and guide our speech. We pray that all that is said and done tonight will be to your honor and to your glory. Lord, we want to pray for us as a church and we want to pray for our leadership and um, every member, we want to pray for the shut-ins tonight, those who are hurting, those who are having um, problems, various problems, Lord, we pray that you just comfort them and, and be with them. We ask it also that you just guide our teacher tonight, the one who will break the word to us, so Father, that you just strengthen him by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome again, everyone. Um, everybody here um, has been here, so you know how we handle uh, the rules here. Uh, I ask you to mute your mic unless you have a question for Reverend Chisholm or an observation while he is speaking. Just uh, raise your hand or use the um, raise hand icon or in, put it in the chat. We'll acknowledge you and uh, we will go from there. All right, and we do record the session so we can put it on the YouTube channel for those who cannot come on uh, so they can um, catch up with us anytime they can, any, anytime they have available. Uh, announcements I have, I want to remind everybody, Sunday, this Sunday, God willing, is Harvest Sunday. So, uh, you know, if, if, if you're able and willing, you can come on out and, and come and worship with us and uh, show your thankfulness for what God has done um, for you and your family. Bring from your garden if you're a, you have a big green thumb like like uh, Sister Green was talking about earlier before we started, or uh, if you're if you're able to bake and make in the kitchen and things like that. I, I you know I used to love a harvest time because I always look uh, forward to like drops and pink and white <laughs> coconut cake, you know, and the greater cake and 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 uh, gizadas and things like that you know, um, and the different cakes and stuff. And, and my wife always um, used to trouble me. Did you bring home any potato pudding for me? <laughs> yes, so, I'm delighted. <laughs> you know, so um, if that's your thing, you can do that as well. And, and if you need either of those, then you can just bring a harvest offering uh, showing, um, you know, giving back a little bit of what God has blessed you with. Um, on Sunday, God willing, the 21st. And, you know, you'll be able to, as we, as we always do, be able to, you know, pick up and purchase anything there after um, service. And um, next week, God willing, is Thanksgiving. And I said it on Sunday, or it was said on Sunday too, you know, we have to, you know, remember what God has done for us and to be thankful, but also to remember each other um, for those people who may not have or may not have a family to share with. Um, you know, let's reach out to them if, if, if you're so inclined to even invite them over for a meal or just to reach out and say hello, we're, you know, thinking of you and checking on you. All right. So, oh, and because of Thanksgiving next Thursday, God's willing, um, as we usually do, we won't be having our Bible study on Wednesday uh, next week, God willing. All right. So don't don't forget. And then Wednesday, while you're marinating your turkey or brining your turkey, <laughs> you know, you, you, you click on the Zoom and where is everybody? You know, so um, we won't be here um, next week, God willing. All right, sir. I'll turn it over to you there, Reverend Chisholm. Thank you, my brother. Good evening, brethren. Before I continue, I want to just ask a teacher's mischievous question. Tell me something significant that any of you learned from the session last week, understanding covenant, et cetera, et cetera, and the, what we presented last week. Anybody, an idea that stuck with you, maybe it was new or something that was reinforced in your brain that you knew before, but anything of significance from last week's session, last week's Good session. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Hi, Padre. Um, yes, I am... Doreen. 
I, I did not know that all 10 commandments were not repeated in the New Testament. So that was new to me. And I appreciated that thought alone. I am, I am mulling. And I really appreciate you pointing that out because that, that, that stuck with me from everything. Cause I, you know, okay. I couldn't, when you, when you made the point and I asked and you referenced that, I was like, whoa, now I see, you know, I see where, so I, uh, that stuck with me the whole week and still it will stick with me for a while to come. That is, that is basically, like you said, if I, the foundation of explaining the difference between the, where the subject was last week and mm. differentiate that between worshiping where, wherever and however. Good. Right. Anybody else? A thought that lingers with you from last week's study? That the uh, Sabbath was not a commandment given in, in Genesis. Excellent. Right. First of all, Exodus. Exodus, yes. Yeah. Not, not, not a requirement. Yeah. Not mentioned even in the whole of Genesis. Yeah. Nobody's commanded to observe any Sabbath. And one thing, one of the, I wrote down here, it says, um, Described versus prescribed. Mm -hmm. so not, nothing, nothing there says that, uh, it says not said that God's rest was prescribed for anyone else. Mm -hmm. God's rest. So he, he rested. Yeah, which means yeah. that he stopped creating. He stopped creating, right. Didn't cool out, you know. Right, you know. Sleep, just, you know, sleep a day, you know, rest his body drink, physically. Drink, yeah. a, drink a lemonade and, you know, <laughs> right. under, under an umbrella. Or a up juice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything else, anybody else? Oh, um, and I think this is this is something that I guess we miss, and I can include myself in that is you, you can't include yourself into a covenant if you're not a party of the covenant. Right. And the yeah. easy way to remember that, uh, Damien and brethren generally, is think of a modern day contract. Yes. If you're not a party to the contract, you, no matter how attractive the contract is for you, you're expressly out because you're not explicitly stated in the contract. You're not a co contract party member. Right. So uh, people who are claiming that they're spiritual Jews, okay, that's your claim. But are you in fact a spiritual Jew? Only God cut the covenant at Sinai, Horeb, you know, with the people who are, the Jewish people who are exiting Egyptian bondage and with them only. And the text in Deuteronomy 5 says, he did not cut this covenant with our fathers, meaning Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and those fellows, mm -hmm. but with us who are here, you know, exiting Egyptian bondage. So the, a context, a covenant like a contract is extremely specific and exclusive. If you're not expressly in it, you're expressly out of it. And, and that all the covenants came to an end at Calvary. At, right. Calvary is the climax point for the Abrahamic covenant and for the Mosaic old covenant. We are now under a new covenant of grace. Yeah. All right. I'm going to pick up <laughs> on what is for me the central death knell to Sab Sabbatarianism, the book of Galatians. I have done a series of Bible teaching in and Keswick in Barbados, I have three CDs, no MP3 downloads on my website. So that's a good um, five hours of material expounding Galatians at the Bible reading in uh, Barbados. Barbados is the only Keswick community that has the peculiarity of uh, the night meetings. They have two, two speakers each night. Mm. Kind of crazy, you know, you have a junior and a senior. The more seasoned clergyman is the one that speaks, uh, speaks. last. Last, yeah, right. So that the, the the younger or the less experienced would take the shine off the ball, and then the runs are are made by the, the seasoned speaker. I yeah. appeared as the, the junior to uh, Steve Noel for one year, and to the the chairman of British uh, British Keswick another year. And when I went to Sheffield to study, I would go to his church on evenings and go to the Baptist church nearby where I was staying. One morning. So we, had, we continued our friendship. I, I've been out of touch with them for years. But anyway, Galatians is extremely crucial for me. I've expounded this before, Seventh day Adventists, and invited a lecturer at Northern Caribbean University, a good friend of mine. We, he was a staff member at CGSD before I resigned and came back to Florida. And, and at the time he was a lecturer and I was a Seventh day Adventist, he has left the movement now. He's on his own, started a work in Spanish town. So I said, Doc, 
Clinton Baldwin, you and I share first name. I said, Dr. Baldwin, feel free to challenge me on anything that I'm saying. Say, go ahead, Reverend Chisholm. If I'm led to challenge you, I will challenge you. You know that. So please go ahead. So, but, so this book is very foundational for me. So it's a very important teaching block of scripture on the Christian's relationship with the law, this epistle to the Galatians. Let me just put up this so that you can follow me with it. For a fuller treatment of this epistle, I would recommend my three-part CD series, Galatians, the Christian and the Mosaic Law. That's on my website. And the companion DVD. This I'm not dead sure the DVD is on the website, but I'll check it out um, and tell you whether I found it there so you can have recourse to it. The Sabbath Sunday debate, a live debate that was recorded at Tarrant Baptist Church in Kingston between, uh, well, among Ian Boyne and Fisher, they were the Sabbatarians and, and against me. So it was really fun filled. I mean, we are good friends. I knew Fisher from, we were both in the Assemblies of God as youngsters. And then he became a member of the Armstrongite movement and joined Ian Boyne as pastor in that debate. So you can take recourse to the material if you want to ponder it in greater depth than I will be able to go through in this series with you. All right. So let me just share now some of the main insights that this epistle offers for our discussion. But first, a bit of background information. There was a problem in the Galatian church, and the problem had to do with the place of the Mosaic law in attaining and maintaining special and sufficient spiritual status before God. That was the problem. So in Galatians 1, 8 to 9, Paul denounces the call to keep the law and be circumcised and regards such teaching as a perversion of the gospel. In fact, he did something, he challenged Peter. He pronounces a curse upon those involved in this perversion of the gospel. He says in verse, the gospel which I preach to you, no, right, the gospel which I preach to you, I think I have this on screen now. The gospel which I preach to you is the standard, the gauge, the yardstick, the bellwether mark, I think is another expression. Accept nothing else. If anybody deviates from what I have told you in Galatia, Pronounce a curse on that person. Don't listen to him or her. Don't give any of them a hearing. What is of critical importance is the point Paul goes on to make. He asserts in Galatians 2, 2 and 7 to 9 that the content of the gospel he was preaching had the approval of Peter, James, and John. So he was not a renegade, um, you know, radical preacher diverting or, you know, going from the traditional preachings of the senior apostles. No, he, his gospel was approved, he's saying, by the senior, senior apostles before him, even though he kind of dismisses um, the senior and say it doesn't matter before God, you know, but kind of a thing. Understandably then, in the latter portion of Galatians 2, Paul relates two things. One is denunciation of Peter, and two is defense of the gospel, he was that fussy about orthodoxy, solid, true doctrine. And he, he challenged Peter in public. I think I mentioned to you guys, I had to do a Greek exegesis on that text. That, and the question had to do with why, why did um, Paul choose to rebuke Peter, a senior apostle, in public? Couldn't he have pulled him one away, as we say in Jamaica, and just talk with him or rock him up privately? Why in public? And for good reason. But what prompted this public rebuke of a senior apostle? Galatians 2, 12 to 13 explains, Peter, though a Jew, normally and correctly, ate with his Gentile brethren, because this is after Calvary, thereby setting aside Jewish dietary restrictions found in the Mosaic law. If you are liberated, um, born again, Jew, you know Jesus and you know this, see, the cruciality of Calvary, then you realize the dietary laws and all that is in the Mosaic economy has been done for it came to an end. But when the Orthodox Jews came from Jerusalem, Peter backed off eating with the, with the Gentiles, thereby suggesting by his behavior that the dietary laws are still valid before God. And Paul watched that with disgust. And so he rebuked um, 
Peter. According to Galatians 2.14, Paul saw that the truth of the gospel was at stake, and so he rebuked Peter publicly. Paul was saying, in essence, quote, live what you preach and preach what you live, normally and correctly. You live like the Gentiles, free from the law. Why then by your present behavior are you suggesting that Gentiles live as Jews? So that was a bold move on Paul's part, but uh, courage is very necessary when the truth is compromised. Even if a person is older than you, is a clergyman and you are just a member, so you say, and the clergyman has gone off biblical track, then you should lovingly call that clergyman or clergy person rather to go back to the tracks of scripture because that is our yardstick or blueprint or bellwether marker. You can't go beyond that. So I'm going to listen to a crucial section from the NIV, the principle that Paul was advocating in Galatians 2.15. Let me put this up for your clarity. This rebuke is happening after Calvary and Jewish dietary laws, integral parts of the Mosaic law, were still being observed by Jewish Christians. They were young in the faith and so they are pardonable. So the point I wanted to make, but I really, let me just read this verse for you, NIV. We who are Jews by birth, this is what Paul said to Peter, and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too, as Jews, have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified, that is acquitted or declared not guilty before God. I want to just retranslate that and amplify it a bit for you to reinforce this critical theological point and principle that Paul is making. He says, we as born and bred Jews, knowing that attaining spiritual status before God comes not by obedience to the law, not by circumcision, nor by heeding dietary restrictions, nor by keeping special days, months, years, or times. But by faith in Jesus, even we Jews believed in Jesus so that we might attain spiritual status with God. Now Galatians 2, 17 to 19 are difficult verses. You might want to open your Bibles there, please. Galatians chapter 2, 17 to 19. <coughs> Excuse me. Would somebody just read those verses for me, please? And then I'll give a little clarification. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Right. So there are difficult verses but some basic understanding of these verses is necessary. In these verses, Paul implicitly deals with a thought that could be in the mind of an Orthodox Jew. It seems that for the Orthodox Jew, a gospel of salvation or justification by grace through faith, and in Jamaican we say just so, so grace through faith, in Jesus would not only remove incentive for moral effort, but could lead to lower moral standards than under the law of Moses. Thus, Christ would be aiding and abetting sin. That is how an Orthodox Jew, though born again, could be thinking. And Paul anticipated that and he's dealing with it here. Paul rejects that line of reasoning and argues that if sin is found in the life of the one justified by faith, the conclusion to be drawn is not that Christ caused the sin. And the option then would not be to rebuild the system of law keeping to be justified since the one who has been born has been justified ceases to live in that world where the law is dominant as he says in verse 19 quote for i through the law died to the law that i might live to god that is live under this control of god for the honor of god the ever popular verse 20 must be read quote i have been crucified with christ not i am crucified with christ the distinction is very acute because the Greek has a, has a perfect tense there, suggesting something has happened in the past, but has abiding significance in the present. So 
better. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The point here is that Paul and all believers in Jesus judicially died with Christ. And it is that identification with Christ's death through faith that places the believer in a new sphere and in a new relationship with God. Watch now the concluding thrust of chapter 2 in verse 21. This verse is insightful. Listen to it from today's English version. Quote, if a man is put right with God through the law, it means that Christ died for nothing, a waste of time. Let me say it another way. If spiritual status or standing comes through the law, Jesus Christ died in vain. If one could attain special and sufficient spiritual status and standing through circumcision, dietary laws, and Sabbath keeping, all works of the law, then the death of Christ was a grand waste of time. This is the point Paul is making. It could not come through the law. It could only come through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. So let me now put up this other thing. In Galatians 2.15, uh, and following, Paul states a theological principle which was absolutely fundamental and central to the whole argument in the epistle. By observing the law, no one will be justified, that is acquitted or declared not guilty before God. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul continues his theological argument to show the Galatians that the law is not necessary for special and sufficient spiritual status or standing before God. In this chapter, Paul draws on the experience of the Galatians. Let me put this up on screen for you. And the experience of Abraham to prove his point that the law is not necessary to be right before God. So Paul challenges the Galatians to remember that they received the spirit and had miracles done in their midst. And that is a present tense. Do you have miracles being done in your midst by the law or by faith in Jesus? And it's a rhetorical question in chapter three. You would have to know Paul. We, we have we, miracles are being done in our midst by putting faith in Jesus, not by heeding the Mosaic law. So he uses Abraham prior to the Mosaic law. He says, put faith in God and receive spiritual status and standing with God. The thrust of Galatians 3 up to verse 14 is this. God intended that all receive special and sufficient spiritual status on the basis of faith. Old Testament scripture predicted that the Gentiles would receive the inheritance of Abraham on the basis of faith. The death of Christ was for the purpose of making this special spiritual status available to Gentiles, especially on the basis of faith. And then now ponder this in verses 15 to 18 of chapter 3. The issue is the tension between the Mosaic law and the Abrahamic promise. Because someone might say to Paul, okay, what you have said about the promise to Abraham and the cruciality of faith to that promise is correct. But that was the arrangement before the law came. Now that the law has come, it has annulled or added to that arrangement. Paul anticipates and deals with such an objection. And I want you to watch the pictorial overview that I'm going to give you now of chapters 3 and 4. Paul is arguing like a very trained lawyer. And he very likely had legal training under his tutors. So watch this closely now. Here is the, the a kind of an overview of the, the bandwidth that Paul is putting before them. The Abrahamic covenant was cut at a certain point, the extreme left of the slide. 430 years later, the Mosaic covenant was cut with the people who were exiting Egyptian bondage. And the law reigned until Calvary. And after Calvary, the spirit and Christ's supreme law of love would operate. So that is the overview pictorially. So let me just take you through now some wording. So in verse 15, Paul takes a case of a legal contract, a person's agreed on, signed and sealed contract. No one, he says, can alter this contract except the party or parties who effected the agreement. The contract cannot be annulled or added to by anyone else. If you're reading the King James Version, 
it uses a very old word, disannul. We would just say no, annul, plain and simple, just like the Americanism I tell my students to avoid uh, disfran disenfranchise. The British version, which is better, is disfranchise. The franchise is given to you to vote. If you don't exercise it, if somebody takes that away from you, then they have made you disfranchised, not disenfranchised. But that's Americanism, and it operates for those of us who live in the USA and with United States television. Many people in the Caribbean have picked up that Americanism. Like, so this like, uh, like irregardless. Yes, irregardless is not even not, not found in any dictionary. Right. It's regardless. Regardless, yeah. Yeah, we and uh, the Jamaicans have still and yet. Still yet same something. Pick the one or the other. One or the other, the, yeah. The, the <laughs> law was annulled at Calvary, and yet we are still behaving as if the law is still operative. Or you could say, and still Sabbatarians are behaving as if the law is still operative. So we have to just, just clarify our language. The point of verse 16, all right, let me go back. The point of verse 16 is that God ratified a covenant or promise with Abraham and his seed, that is with Jesus Christ. The, we know that the law in verse 17, I need to keep this up and ask somebody to read for me means the Mosaic Covenant because of the link in Exodus 12 and verse 40. Would somebody just flip to that and read for me, please? Exodus 12 and verse 40. And another person just finding... 17 through? Galatians 3.17 for after the reading of Exodus 12, 40. And this I say, <clears throat> that the law, which was 430 years later. What are you reading Galatians 3? Exodus. Exodus 12, 40. Galatians 12, 40. No, no, we'll, we'll, we'll take Galatians 3, 17 right after Brother Errol. So Exodus 12, 40, no, Pastor, you have it? Okay. So the mm. earning of the children of Israel was dwelt who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. Right. So you have that 430 years marker. No Galatians 317. And this I say that the law, which is 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. All right, so despite the fact that the law came later than the Abrahamic promise, it does nothing at all to the Abrahamic promise is what Paul's point is here, a logical point. It does not add to it, and it cannot subtract from it. So with deep spiritual insight on the Abrahamic promise or covenant, Paul was saying, even though the promise was made before Christ, that is pre-incarnation, its fulfillment was in Christ. So the seed that the text is mentioning here for Paul is not Isaac as Abraham's son. He was looking beyond that. Isaac was kind of a, a foreshadowing, a prefiguring of our Lord Jesus Christ. The real seed is Christ. That's and in fact, he makes a fussy, unnecessary, in my view, grammatical point. He does not say seeds, plural, but seed, singular. You know, We know that in English, a seed can be a collective um, uh, our seeds can be a collective singular or so on, but he's making that kind of a fussy point just to bring home the point that the supreme seed is not Isaac or Ishmael, it is Jesus Christ our Lord. So that in spite of the covenant's age and in spite of all that happened over the centuries, that covenant still stands ratified and the Mosaic law which came between the promise and its fulfillment cannot and does not annul the covenant, and therefore cannot, and does not affect or alter the promise. That's the force of verse 17 of Galatians 3. Now verse 18 adds that if the blessing through Abraham's seed, depending on the Mosaic law, then it would not be based on promise, but God had said the inheritance would be based on the promise. Having argued that the inheritance does not come by law, Paul raises a crucial question in verse 19. 
a question that an Orthodox Jew listening to Paul's argument would have asked. Why then did God give the law? What is its purpose? If it comes after the Abrahamic covenant promise and does not add to it nor detract from it, then why on God's earth did God give the law? Would be my version of that question. Since the law cannot save, cannot give special and sufficient spiritual status before God, what then is the law's purpose? Verse 19. So Paul is going to be telling them now the purpose of the law. And he's going to be arguing very clearly. I want this to sink in. So let me just take you just a little bit further. And then we will. The law was given to regulate moral conduct till or until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. That's what he's saying in verse 19. So here you have a description of the law and the duration of the law. The law is described as a moral regulator of conduct and the duration until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Either the incarnation or more specifically, the crucifixion resurrection of our law, the climax point, point for the law. It was given and described as a moral regulator, but until that's the duration, the end point of its job as a moral regulator is Calvary. So the law had a purpose for a stated duration for a specified period of time. Never miss that and let no modern law keeper lead you to overlook or gloss over that fact. The force of Paul's teaching here is that Calvary brought the law to a head and to its end. Its job having been completed there, it became redundant. I'm gonna show you in Corinthians and Ephesians and Colossians that Paul makes this same point in his different ones of his epistles because for him it is absolutely crucial. The heart of the gospel is that a person is set right spiritually not by doing, not by heeding the Mosaic, the prescriptions of the Mosaic law dutifully, even perfectly, gets you nowhere. You get right with God, you stay right with God by faith, by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. Paul will make the same point by describing the law in other terms, but always description and duration go together. So in verse 23, the law was a restrainer of conduct. You don't live like Lego beasts. The law says, look, these things are wrong. These things ought not to be in your life as a follower of God until faith should come. That's the duration of when faith was made available through the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary, then faith becomes operative, is the point in verse 23. Before that, the law was restraining human conduct until faith was available. The law is described as a custodian until Christ, to bring us to Christ for spiritual status by faith, verse 24. The law is described as a child minder. The Greek is pedagogos, from which we educators we get pedagogy. Pedagogy is um, leading infants or minors. Andragogy is leading adults educationally. So the pedagogos is an infant leader until faith should come, verse 25. And then I think I'll stop here and take your questions and comments. But why is it that we who are in Christ by faith are no longer under the custodian, the child minder? I'm going to do what Alfred Hitchcock does with his movies. For that, you'll have to come next time. We will have to continue this, um, maybe Damian allowing in December, you know, or thereabouts. So we will, let me just pause here and open for your questions, your comments, and your observations. Great, anybody, questions, comments? I, I, like, verse, I like verse six of, of chapter three, where it says, even, even um, Abraham, mm -hmm. Didn't uh, no, it was that he followed the law, but that, that he believed. Yeah, and it was accounted. And to it him was for accounted unto him for righteousness. Right. So it was not any works thing that got Abraham set up before God. It was faith. Yeah. Just. I like, I like that you point out in nineteen. You know, my. You know, I just wrote beside nineteen that you know, the law 
basically was a temporary thing and, and now that we have Jesus, it's eternal. So yes, I, that's right. We have reached destination in Jesus. Yes. So the, the, the child mind is, is now redundant. Yeah. So the law the was job was temporary. to guide us to faith in Jesus. Having done that job extremely well, now you don't we say bye-bye. Stick upon the eternal and stick to that. That's right. That's right. Uh, I think um, Brother Earl. Fingers going up. Who's was it? Brother, Brother Earl. Yeah. Go, Brother Earl. I have a few questions, but I was going to start with a statement. Mm -hmm. uh, in my earlier studies of the Mosaic law, <clears throat> there was a point when I believe Moses was speaking to the, the Jews mm -hmm. concerning some of the things God had told him mm -hmm. to tell them. And they were a little presumptuous. And um, they said, well, you know, whatever he says, we'll do. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's where the law really stemmed from, the, the Ten Commandments. Yeah, and it was more, remember last week we said it was the heart is the Ten Commandments, but there's a bundle of other regulations in Exodus yeah. going up to about chapter 24. Yeah, but I believe it came about because of the, um, I don't know, just I'm trying to remember what, what, you know, it was Exodus, so you, you know, the Jews there were, were a little reluctant to even, you know, this to God, and um, they were, you know, saying whatever he says we'd be able to do. Mm -hmm. So they were given the Ten Commandments, you know, which God knew already that this was a point that they need to seek him and seek in his righteousness because they of themselves could not keep no law. And God already knew this, you know, in his, right, right. his omniscience. So um, that's one point. And um, a question I want to ask is, mm -hmm. When it says that we are, we are the wild olive, or the Gentiles are the wild olive that was grafted, mm -hmm. uh, what is your interpretation of that? Well, the, 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 the salvation, as Paul says in Romans, is up to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. So God's primary group of people that he wanted to work with and through for the benefit of the world was the Jewish people. So the Jewish people are like the, the native tree, and we have been grafted in by faith, by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. And then Ephesians said, we are now one family because the middle wall of partition has been broken down. Okay, and um, I'm glad you pointed out also that the Abraham covenant was, you know, was always in existence. It, you know, Mosaic law didn't actually rule it out. This was just added later on because God still like, wanted his people to have faith in him and believe mm -hmm. and trust in him. Right. So, um, and under this, and, and, and we are beneficial beneficiaries of of this covenant by mm -hmm. uh, by faith in Jesus Christ. That's right. And we have all we are now under that 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 great you know promise of um, being blessed mm -hmm. because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Yes. And we are no we are no ears of the real yeah, seed yeah. of Jesus Abraham. Christ. Right. We are no Abraham's seed. And I will. I'm not going to steal my my own thunder for next. <laughs> So I will explore. In fact, my disappointment as a as a Greek lecturer is that the translations leave out, left out rather, mm -hmm. a crucial word with which verse 25 begins. Yeah. It's an explanatory word in the Greek, which Paul is saying, now why do we not need the law to guide us anymore? And then that explanatory word starts verse 25. It's crucial to understand why we are no longer Ob obligated to follow the law and that will come next time we gather God willing lastly I, um, I don't know why um, Christians who are non-Jews are of no Jewish affiliation would consider themselves not, not, not blessed they always said Jews are blessed and here it is we see in Galatians that because of our faith and under the Abrahamic promise that God made <clears throat> that we are also when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're also blessed oh, and yes. fall under the blessings. Oh, yes. And it, the promise was, in you, Abraham, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Amen. That was God's, God's purpose from day Amen. one. He Amen. has to work through a group of people, and he happened to have chosen the, the Jewish people, not because of themselves, mm -hmm. but in spite of them at times, he worked through them so that the whole globe of Gentiles, <laughs> non-Jews, can be blessed. Yes, sir. Thank you. And, and, and I like how you point out the fact that um, 
the, the, the law is necessary, then, and it's still necessary now as a guide to sort of uh, help people to understand mm -hmm. that, that there was a certain kind of behavior that was expected of them. Right. But it was not, it was not something that would give them salvation. Precisely. And we are not without law now no, that the, the mosaic has come to an end at Calvary. We, are, we have spiritual law. We have mm -hmm. boundary markers in the, in the, test, the New Testament documents. So you don't live lawlessly simply because the Mosaic law has come to an end. There are principles, guidelines, you know, laws spiritually embodied in the documents of the New Testament, usually the second part of each epistle, to guide our behavior. And more than that, we have the Blessed Holy Spirit who convicts us, not simply of wrongdoing alone, but of things that are not appropriate for our behavior as believers. It might not be wrong, but it might not be expedient or appropriate for your conduct as a child of God, where you're operating. So the spirit convicts. No law could tell you that. Mm -hmm. You need a somebody, not a something. The law is an external regulator of conduct. The Holy Spirit is an internal regulator of conduct. Pricks your conscience. Chisholm, you can't take that QQ of white rum. It's going to spoil your testimony. People seeing you drinking that QQ of white rum will think it's okay for them to do it too. And by your exercising your freedom, you could lead somebody astray. Throw away the white rum, drink water or lemonade. <laughs> no law book can do that to you, but a person who is inside of you, convicting you, can give you that cue. It's not wrong, it's not sinful, but it's not appropriate for your testimony or for your conduct. That's the power of the Holy Spirit, superior Amen. to any statute book. Amen. So the statute can only tell you, do this, don't do this. And if you blunt, I say, sorry, you messed up. Judgment or penalty, no. Yeah. The Holy Spirit says, my child, confess, acknowledge the convicting force of my power in your life. Openly confess to me, you know, and you will have forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The Lord just simply convicts you and leave you dirty. You have to work out your own salvation kind of a thing with fear and trembling. Can that, that's not possible. <laughs> yeah, the law, is, law was not equipped to do that. Only Jesus. Any a question, a comment, an observation? Anybody else? Okay, I, I don't. I heard, I heard a version that because of what Jesus did, that he fulfilled the law, mm -hmm. and, and only he could mm -hmm. be the Son of God, the righteous one. Right. Since we have obtained his righteousness, all right, all of what he did is within us because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to share that, that particular comment. Right. His righteousness is imputed to us. So yes. God sees us through Jesus. Not Amen. that we are perfect or righteous as we should be, but he's seeing us through Jesus. Amen. Without that look, he's going to see us as guilty before him, deserving of a, a Christless hell. That's right. what our sins have been working for. Yes. But grace covers, you know, Amen. There's a song I've forgotten it. Uh, maybe Sherry could remember. Yeah. Is it uh, Mercy Said Yes or something like that? Mercy Said No. Mercy Said No. Mercy said, yeah, right. So the law. I will never stanza, let you go. Yeah. The law is judging you. The stanza is saying you're, you're judged, but Mercy Said No. That's not the way it's going to go. Mercy comes in. And by the way, mercy is not inherent in law, either divine, uh, not in human law. The prerogative of mercy does not reside in the law court, as you all should know. It resides with the monarch or in a republic. It's a different ballgame. So a representative of the queen in the Caribbean, well, Barbados is going to go ahead of other Caribbean countries and become like Trinidad and Republic soon. But for those of us who are still a, 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 a constitutional monarchy, Mrs. Queen is the head. And the prerogative of mercy resides with her through the governor general. So you have to appeal to the governor general for mercy. You can't appeal to any trial judge. It is not inherent in human law for mercy, but in divine law, justice and mercy came together at Calvary. And so we can be acquitted of our sins because God is acting through what Jesus Christ, our sovereign Lord and Savior, has done for us at Calvary. So there's no contradiction. There's no conflict. Justice and mercy come together at Calvary. But only in that, the gospel that has that peculiarity, do we find that combination. In ordinary human law, it's just strictly justice. 
mercy go extrajudicial. It's not a part of the human law court. Pastor Chisholm, can I ask a question? Sure, anytime. Um, um, all of this, is it tied into, I don't remember what the verse is, but you, um, something about as babies, I mean, if we're outside of the realm of the Holy Spirit guiding us, mm -hmm. okay, are we then being, being, should I say, guided by that external law still? But because, so basically, we are, it's like somebody with a whip over our back trying to tell us what to do. But now, mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're now in the fold and we're now being, being the new covenant. As long as we accept the new covenant, is it then that it's something internal that should guide us and that all comes from the Holy Spirit? Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, that is it. In, in, in fact, I told you once before that it's as if you're, you're looking into my notes. It's not possible for you to see my notes, but that is part of the thunder that I'll bring to verse 25 next week. I told my friend, my dear, dear Ian Boyd and I were very close friends. He's Sabbatarian. I am non-Sabbatarian, but we are close friends. We disagree, but we disagree lovingly. And I said, Ian, and then this is part of the thunder for next week, but no problem repeating it next week. I say, Ian, you realize that by virtue of Galatians and the argumentation, especially in chapter three, you guys who are Sabbatarians are clamoring and you're saying without voicing it, I'm a little pick me. I need somebody to guide me, to tell me thou shalt not, don't do that. So I say, imagine the illustration. And I use this illustration in teaching on the Sabbath. You have a fridge and you have children. You have three children in your house. And you buy, you stock up the fridge for the week. And you say, guys, look, you see, you see the, 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 bottle, the big bottle of lemonade or orange juice? You can only have one small cup or glass per day. Uh, Clinton, did you hear me? One per day. I know you love orange juice, but you cannot have three glasses per day. Your sisters and your brothers won't have any. So you have to tell them specifically, one per day. You, if you have adults in the house, you say, ladies and gentlemen, What's in the fridge or in the cupboard is for the week. Use your discretion. If you are a, a big somebody, you don't have to, thou shalt not, you must not, unless you're kind of big and fool, fool. But with little children, you have to tell them exactly, you must not put this. So when we were spiritual minors, the law had to guide us because we we're spiritually infants. And I can't say anymore, otherwise I'll steal all of my big thunder for verse 25 next week. So you're on track there, Sister Doreen. Anybody Anything else? else? Anybody? Could I, could I ask one more before yes. you? Yes. Yeah. No um, so you're saying that, I mean, I know you're going to do it next week, but then it's going to stay with me and it, it's going to bother me. So let me just ask you. <laughs> you yes. actually could be a seasoned Christian, but you're still, even though you think you're being guided internally mm -hmm. because of blindness, you could actually be, be, be still under the law. Yeah. And, and you could literally, and, 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 and because of either ignorance, presumption, whatever it is, you could still be, 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 be right where you were not supposed to be. In fact, Sister Doreen, I will say this. We who observe Sunday as our day of worship, and maybe rest as well, have to make sure we don't bring in Sunday legalism. So you can't go to a supermarket and buy something on a Sunday. You say, me, Mr. Brother Clinton, I'm a supermarket on a Sunday. Imagine a clergyman in a supermarket on a Sunday. So what's wrong with that? Nothing is wrong with it because you are not obligated to observe any particular day before God. So you can become a Sunday legalist, just like the Saturday legalist, you know? We have to be careful about those things. Anybody else? Question, observation, right? Uh, yeah, brother, just, um, so I was, somebody was um, verbalizing to me that the name Jesus um, should never be used. This is an offshoot. And I, I just want to, you know, how did that translation, you know, came in the English language? And, uh, well, your translations are, you receive a word in your receptor language, it is called in our case, English from the Greek of the New Testament or the Hebrew of the Old Testament. I have heard a little, I call it a foolish fussiness nowadays about Hebrew words. A little fellow, I knew that fellow from a certain church I taught in their Bible school. And this guy knows that I have a master's degree in biblical languages. And he challenged me, he's challenging me at 
um, the supermarket just across in halfway tree. I forgot the name of it now. And he's saying, but that is, um, you realize that you're not supposed to be using the word Jesus. You must use Yeshua. He say, <laughs> are, we, are we speaking Hebrew now or are we speaking English? I said, look, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Take it from me. I have a master's degree in biblical languages. If we are talking English, Jesus is a legitimate translation of Yeshua is a full of per fuller version or Yeshua the shortened version and it is Jesus in Greek Yeshua or Yehoshua in in Hebrew so we are talking English you want to talk Hebrew let's talk Hebrew then go ahead <laughs> say something to me in Hebrew we will have that really I, I, but he had nothing to say and it, the guy is still in my face you know I yeah. said but Rev I'm telling you you're not supposed to use the word Jesus I said look let me not waste your time or my time have a nice day the Lord bless you I'll be just walk off and leave him <laughs> kind of no sense <laughs> I had to be blunt with him. I said, look, you're pressing a point that you cannot defend. You don't know Hebrew. You have picked up a little tradition. So they have, they, they have um, a, a, a particular grouping of Christians. They call assemblies of Yahweh. So you can't use the word G-O-D anymore. You have to say Yahweh because it's the, this, the Hebrew term for God. I said, give me a break. So another thing that people be like, for instance, when you say, you say, you say, uh, trying to remember now the Arabic word for God. Allah. Allah. Allah is an Arabic term. It is not a Muslim term. Yeah. My friends who are in Barbados, the Yazan, the Azans, who are Arabic in ethnicity, they say this is the language we talk when we are praying to God. We say Allah. If we are praying in Arabic, it's simply the Arabic word for God. So you can't tell a person who is of you know, that Eastern extraction, Middle Eastern extraction, that they can't use their own language, Allah. No, that's how they pray in, in, in their language, native tongue, they pray to God, Allah. All right, so I, sometimes, I went... sometimes a little learning is just what is mixing up people, and people must realize the limits of their ignorance. Well, I, you know, I was attacked. <laughs> I was attacked today with that the same attack that you had, the experience. And uh, so what I said was that even God when they asked, you know, who sent, to, who should I, when Moses, who said I say, sent me? Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, tell him I am sent you. Mm -hmm. And somebody in the, the interpretation are the, it was a why, what is it? Why double, what is it? Yahweh, but it, it yeah. in the, the middle words in between, but it was a Y H W H, I believe that was or the. Y V W H W H. Yeah. That was a term for God. So, um, you know. All right, we'll added later, but it's translated the receptor language. Not yeah. every word in one language can come across because there are some words that can come across into English, in English from certain language. So you have to use the word in the original language. But if it can be translated, I had a, a, a discussion, a debate with Muta Baruka, and he was trying to make the point that Jesus is drawn from Zeus. <laughs> yeah, I heard that one today too. Yeah, he heard. He heard that the Greek word for Jesus is Jesus. Yes. But Zeus is a completely different spelling. So in my book, Revelations on Rastafari, I have a little short chapter where I show the letters in Greek for Jesus and show the letters in Greek for Zeus. Radically different, no relationship. They just are fooled by sound because of their ignorance. And I'm saying, you know, after a while, it, it becomes irritating, you know, to hear people <laughs> going on with this. And it takes a lot of patience with me, from me, to just say, all right, lovingly, calmly, let me just share this with you. Look at this. This is Jesus in Greek. You see the Greek letters there? No, this is the Greek word for, for Zeus. And even in English, you pronounce it Zeus, not Zeus. Z-E-U-S is not Zeus. It is Zeus because it is Greek derived and it maintains the Greek pronunciation Zeus rather than I, Zeus. I will use, I'll use that tonight in, in a <laughs> <laughs> to complete my, my, what I was telling those folks. All right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, Sister Holly, go ahead. Okay, I thought our other advocate, uh, Dorian, yes. was our other advocate, but she's actually here. Um, so, so, um, Reverend Chisholm, I just wanted to see if you would elaborate some more on something that you said. Uh, it's something that I struggle with. Mm -hmm. Um, so you mentioned about legalism as to um, being um, judged for, for being in the supermarket. That's the example you chose. Right, on right. A Sunday, which in other is words, day, doing something which, which people would regard as... Right, so this is, this is... Yeah, so it's something I struggle with. And then the way, the way, the conclusion I came to, 
and so that's why I would like it to be addressed is, is that if that is the day we choose, then we should try our utmost best not to do things that are unnecessary and unnecessary might not be the right word. Um, so um, for example, if you, if you know there's medication you need to take, mm -hmm. then why would you wait until that day? Because uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it says to set aside that, that a day was set aside um, for rest and worship. Yes, but so that that's was under the, the Mosaic law. There's no such regulation for Sunday. Oh, in there's Romans no such? 14, in Romans 14, Paul deals with that. It says one day, one man esteems a day uh, better than, or higher than another. Another person esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So he's disregarding the fussiness that people have on a, a particular day. Neither Saturday nor Sunday has to be legalistically heeded as a day for rest and worship. Don't uh, miss your, your need for rest, nor your need for worship though, you know, cause you're gonna so hurt. The I'm, so the question I'm asking is then, mm. so are you saying then that you don't necessarily have to set aside a day? Because, because in, the, in the statement you said, you know, we choose Sunday versus Saturday. So are you saying then that we don't have to choose a day? I mean, like you know, I read my Bible every day, I pray every day, mm. but, but on Sunday, I, I try my best not to do something that, is on, that I could have done another day. Precisely. You know, if that works for you, fine. But what about the nurses who have to work or the doctors who have to work on a Sunday? Well, well, this is, well that's exactly what I'm saying. The, the mm. nurses and the doctors who have to work on Sunday, that's something that has to be done. You, you can right. hear me clearly. Hear right. me clearly, but I'm talking about the things that, that you, for you example, if you have an emergency day. and you have to go to get medication, but if it's medication that you knew, like your diabetic medicine, mm -hmm. that you get it on another day, so that day, you, that's the day you chose. So are you, are, you, are you saying that it doesn't have to be a special day as long as you... If you know, I want, you know it's, it just so happened that I had this discussion with, with someone and I'm going to share with all of you now, two days ago, mm -hmm. because um, I'm retired, but I'm doing per diem covering for some cancer centers. Mm -hmm. And um, traditionally, even when I was working, they closed for two days for Thanksgiving, Thursday and Friday. Mm -hmm. And um, they don't... Um, uh, because they don't want cancer patients going that long without treatment. So they yeah. asked me, would you, so then they open on Sunday and they yeah. asked me, would you come in on Sunday? And I said, no. And then he asked me, why not? And I said, well, that's the day I go to church. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you know, they stream service live and all of that. And then I, I came back with, yeah, but the Bible says do not dismiss the assembling together. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I feel a special bond of fellowship when I go into the sanctuary, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then, he, and then he was trying to say just like that. But you could choose another day, da 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 da. But that's the day I chose, Precisely. and I had a choice. Mm -hmm. It's not like this was my because in my regular job when I was on call, and I had to go to work on Sunday, I went to work. But I still, if I had a choice between choosing the time. I would choose a time that doesn't conflict with the time that worship is at church. That's your gathering, right, right, right. Right, and then and, and then I had with, with all Jewish doctors would fight with me, and mm. I would say to them, "Listen, you rush Friday evenings to go home before the sun is down or whatever." Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this is and 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 they'd say, "What time can you come?" I'd say two o'clock, and they were, "What time do you go to church?" I said nine o'clock. Well, do you spend six hours at church? I said, do you spend all day in the temple? So <laughs> yeah, yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That, so, that, that should shut their mouths. Yeah, it sure did. So what I'm trying to say is that that I understand. And I know that they, you know, how they tried to trick Jesus about healing on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So the things that have to be done, I understand, but it's the things that like the supermarket, you know, it's yeah. funny. Everything is coming like I didn't talk before and I'm talking so much. No Even problem. last Sunday, you know, last Sunday I went to the supermarket and it's fun you brought it up. 
And you know what I said to someone? Oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to the supermarket today. I, I you know, this is, yeah, for real. <laughs> so, because I felt like I should have done it Saturday because yeah. I choose to worship Sunday. Mm. So it's, I wasn't even thinking of a law. I was just thinking of that. This is the day that you I chose. Say, yeah, for, for rest and worship. And that I should only do the things that are unavoidable that day. That's right. And I, and I, and I, and I don't think that that was the day that you chose. Sorry? I don't think that that was the day you chose. It was chosen for you. From you were growing up, you were told that Sunday is the day of worship. And, and, yes. and you're, you're, you're adopted. Yes, that's, that's my, yes. And, and, yes. and that's I, it. You're right. So I shouldn't use the word choose. I should eliminate choose and say that's the day I worship. Yeah, right. Uh, he's not he's not um, quibbling with you, but you know, fine. That principle stands, but I don't mm -hmm. want you to have it in your mind that if, let's say you forgot, or you know, in business you forgot to have done your supermarket shopping on a Friday or a Saturday, and you need something, and you rush out on a Sunday, you have not sinned. Mm -hmm. No, you have broken your tradition, but you have not sinned before God. Okay. And you don't even have to go pray about it. That's right. There's nothing to, to ask forgiveness for. You have not sinned. You have broken your No, I mean, I mean, I, I I I I know all of that. I just I just feel like it's I know all of that. I didn't you sin, I don't want forgiveness. But I know I just feel like if it's a commitment, it's like you're not committed. You know, you're, you're frivolous. You're, you're like hanky-panky. No, hanky-panky. Yeah, but, but, well, Miss Ali. You know yourself that it is not you. Right. Miss Ali, you, you hold on to that because I don't want you to be going shopping on a Sunday when you should be in church. <laughs> you hold on to that, okay? Yeah, see what Miss Ali is It is an, a, an abuse of our tradition. <laughs> there's, there's people that on the opposite, Miss Holly, that use it as an excuse. Right, you know, like oh, ch so church is online now, or whatever. Yeah. I can, yeah. I can get it whenever. Which is, which know. is exactly what that man was saying to me. Yeah, say, right. say, say, uh, honey, you could watch it online later. Uh, you know? Overstep. You, yeah, you, you want the, the active fellowship, and that's your choice to have the active fellowship. That's your preference. Take it. Yeah. Let them do what they want. I thought I saw iPad. Yeah, with Cherie, Amanda. Cherie, and then um, Sister Doreen, and then Brother Earl. I think it boils down to what has been said several times. It's like there's a verse that says man is made. Well, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's it ends up being that's our Lord. And it's not me. something. It's a, it's and it and, and nobody wrote a list of things to do and not to do on the Sabbath. I mean, I think they do have some sort of a list in the Jewish tradition, mm -hmm. but. Um, just in terms of saying, you know, you can do this or you can't do this, or this constitutes is not rest. For some people, going to the grocery store is a restful, you know, thing to do. You know, they, they, it's something that they do that they enjoy. And, and, and it's about not keeping um, con, con, condemnation on yourself or anybody else. If that works for you, um, do it. If it doesn't work for you, then don't do it, and yeah, don't make it work for somebody else. Right. That's the don't, same. Don't put don't put those don't heavy prescribe burdens. Prescribe it for anybody else, right? Yeah, and and tell somebody that they should not be doing this or they should not be doing that because you feel that that you shouldn't be doing it. Mm. Um, it again, as Reverend Chisholm said, you know that the Holy Spirit is the one that leads us, and if if the Holy Spirit says that you are not supposed to eat chocolate cake. It's not a sin for anybody else to eat chocolate cake, but for you it is because you were told not to do it, you know? Yeah. So it's the same kind of thing. You can't walk around with a plaque saying, don't eat chocolate cake because it's a sin, you know? <laughs> but that's, that's kind of how you have to remember that you have his freedom and his grace um, and that you need to live in that freedom and that grace um, and not allow a day or a certain thing to make it, you know, become oppressive. In any way. Right. right. Sister mm -hmm. Doreen and then Brother Earl and then Sister Marva. Sister Marva's hand is up. Yeah, Sister okay. Doreen is up too. My, my point, Sheree actually took the last, the last part of what Sheree said was going to be my point. 
I think we condemn ourselves in so many things that we do. And 90% of the time, again, going back to, it is not even something that's coming from internal. It's what the outside is seeing that we're worried about. Mm. So again, you know, I, I, I like what Sherry said at the end. I mean, don't condemn yourself and don't allow anybody to condemn you. If you, you know, you know what, you know what and who you're living for. And if that takes you outside the realm of going to pick up some butter on a Sunday, don't condemn yourself and don't let anybody else condemn you for doing it either. Because again, don't let somebody else judge you when you're, I mean, we're all just trying to live this life that we are not, you know, it is, it is not easy to walk on this path that we're living. Mm. And 90% of the time when we fuss about the little things, like, like you said, and I said it last week, I mean, Am I a Sabbath keeper? No, but two of the best, the most vocal speakers and the best speakers we have now that preach on, our, preach on our pulpit are Sabbath keepers. And as long as we're trying to walk this road and walk it the best we can from a, from a Bible-based standpoint, I think you should just do the best that you can. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. whatever you're not sure of, just go ask for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Brother, I'm gonna let Sister Marva go since you spoke uh, earlier. And then you can speak after her. Go ahead, Sister Marl. Okay. Here's my thing. Um, in Galatians, it's saying that um, the law was just a schoolmaster towards Christ. Mm-hmm. So in regards to going to church on a Sunday or you have something to do, I think we should be making like a burden. Because mm-hmm. when we do that, we're like the Sabbath people. Then we say, okay, we have to set aside this as a day. We keep it like a Sabbath then, right? Right, that's so what I, I think said. We should, Don't yeah, have a Sunday should, legalism to match exactly, the Sabbath. Exactly. To make this, yeah. So I think we should, you know, Christ is within us. So wherever we go, whether we are in Sunday, Monday, too, we should have it right through the week. So yeah, if we want to worship on a Monday, go ahead and worship on a Monday. We should all do that doing, every day. As long yeah. as you're doing good, you're not doing evil. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. Can I say something to Miss Ali? Oh, yes, oh, oh, hold on, Brother Earl, what's next? I was next? You can't wait, man. I got to finish it, Ray, because I might forget it. I'm not I, young am, like... I, forget, I am forgetting mine, too. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down. I'm not young like you. <laughs> yeah, pull out the head paper and see who all that who. Hey, Ray, this, this is part of you. I mean, what I'm going to say, is, you know, is concerning, you know, you know, Sierra and our, I mean, our church also. Mm, mm. Uh, we understand that, you know, we can have our own Sabbath, but um, I think the other part of the scripture said we should not forsake the assembly and forsake one with another. Mm-hmm. And if if we should, uh, you know, some friends that pass, I want you guys to come and worship on Sunday. And all of we decide, a lot of us decide, say, you know what, no worship on now, but I'll come to church on Sunday. You know, that can create a little problem. So I can mm-hmm. understand not just legalism, sometimes you know, if we have a pastor and we are part of a congregation that, um, you know, and we choose, we are collectively choose to worship on a Sunday, you know, we should just jump and say, you know what, don't because we can worship, have my worship on a Monday and I choose, I'm not going to go to church on Sunday. You won't That's have, the point have group fellowship at all. You have to agree on a day for yeah. group fellowship. It happens to be Sunday for all, for us. So all yeah. other things remaining equal, it's Sunday. Amen. All right. Well, well said, Brother Earl. And 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 the, and this is Miss Miss Holly. Don't make it a habit. But when you work on Sunday, make sure it is reflected in the tithes and offering. <laughs> <laughs> That's above my pay. You are so funny, Reverend Legister. Um, but so... one one thing, sorry, Miss Holly. One thing I want to say: you have churches who would normally meet on a Sunday, but because of their crowds, they have. Sat a worship uh worship services on a Saturday the evening yeah there's you a group in South Florida that did that yeah they, you know and, for them. and there's 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 a bunch of them so you know they have service on Saturday because there's people who can't make it on a Sunday because mm-hmm. they work every Sunday and so that doesn't mean that they're a Seventh Day anything you know mm-hmm. but that's their day that they have selected they, for worship for the, the the portion of their congregation you know, that cannot come out on a Sunday or, or, or and so, 
And it is impractical but, not to have a day when everybody knows that. This right. Is the so you see, no, you and it's, see, and it's, they, no, but it's, it's up to the, it's up to the, the, the body. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So if if the if 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 say, you know, we always say about which is the first day. What what was you know, and we were talking about creation and stuff the other day. What day was number one? Mm. You know, if 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 our given days off were usually a Monday and Tuesday versus Saturday and Sunday, then mm. we probably maybe were we'll a Tuesday one of those days for or a, or a Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, you know. Okay. So, so after, sorry, after yeah. all this discussion, Reverend yes. Chisholm just said you have to have a day, and Pastor Legister just said you have to have a day. So mm. after all this discussion tonight, it might, I hope, erase another feeling, deep-seated feeling that I have mm. that Christians, our Seventh-day Adventist Christians, or mm -hmm. let me put it this way, mm. that, that, that this is a feeling I have, that, that those of us who choose to worship on Sunday, that we are not as committed in terms of of the, the, the time that we're willing to give. Um, you, you're like, so is it is it the law or is it like, am I wrong in saying, you know, the Adventists, they spend all day in church on Saturday, almost literally. Mm -hmm. And I see that as a sign of honor to God. That's how I have seen it. Whereas, in the I'm sorry, Miss Holly. I, I I have to break you there. Isn't there a verse that says something like they're they're there, but their heart is far from me? They're well, in, that's, they're that's they're possible. there in body. That's, that's possible. That's possible. None of us know where the heart is. Um, I, there might be a verse that says that. I'm just telling you how I feel about it. Whereas I sit in Sunday and, and you see people actually looking at the clock, or after the pastor is preaching for ten minutes over a half an hour, we'll be fidgeting. Mm -hmm. and, and, and body language. Yeah, got your point well taken, and it's true. And it's so true. that's that's a long, deep-seated feeling of, I have that it's a lack of commitment. And it could um, very well be. I tell and, you something else that is and, interesting. You know, I could Holly. be wrong, but you, I feel that's how I feel. Li listen to this. I, I share it in a, in a little post that my daughter sends out to people who take my interpretation tidbits. <laughs> Every single Muslim, wherever they live on the planet, whatever their education level is, they want to, all of them, every single one of them wants to learn Arabic. Why? No matter what their mother tongue is. Because the Holy Quran, their holy book, was written in Arabic, not in German, not in English, not in Spanish, not in French. All of them. Every, we can't even get all our people who worship on a Sunday and say they love God to read the Bible in English. Commitment. The, the Muslims are more committed to their practices of their faith than most of us Christians are to the practice of our faith. And Pastor Chisholm, the Jews, listen, I worked in a hospital with Jewish doctors. Let me tell you, there's two in particular, if they're religious. You'll yes, be looking for that doctor. It was so Jesus. bad that they actually brought the prayer room close to the cancer center in the same hallway. You go down to Jackson. They yeah. converted a, a, a room into the prayer room. And when you're looking for, for them, they're in that room. Many times are they praying. Mm -hmm. Same with the Muslims. I was on a Amtrak some years ago. And there was a, a gentleman, a small body gentleman, nicely clad, you know, from a suit, sitting beside me. There was a vacant seat in between us. And after what I dozed off, I sleep a lot on, on transportation, quite frankly. Uh, so I will read a bit and then I sleep off. When I when I woke up, this is my boy kneeled down on him on a mat on the seat. It was his prayer time. He's Muslim, and it was prayer time. The man pulled out him prayer mat while on the seat. Disregard this. Um, okay, we are fellow blacks together. This black fellow beside me, I don't mind. It's my prayer time. The man pulled out him mat, put it down on the seat, and kneeled down on it, and he was having his quiet time. That's commitment. We don't want to say grace in a public facility when we are eat, as if we don't pray normally over our food. <laughs> it's, it's a sign of commitment, and it, it should be a challenge to us. Are we really that committed to our faith? But the Pharisees were super committed. I but... was at three. Every time I'm going to say something, you take it out of me. <laughs> 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 you do not 
You do not, not mistake commitment for what you want the world to see. External, be careful. Right, right. You right. have to be careful in your faith that you do not. Sheree, every time I have a thought, I raise my <laughs> hand, you come up with it. Be careful that what you are seen as commitment might not actually be commitment. That's it's right. because, law, law because abiding. Yep. There you go. Yeah. Somebody just yeah. wants the world to see it and say, oh, I am holier than thou. You yeah. have yeah. to be very, very careful. 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 Point you with have the same point. thing as far as too. Yeah. You have to be very, very careful. And a do. lot of times, that is what we as Christians do. We want everybody to see the outward part outward of us. Outward appearance, yeah. Of us are vile and bitter. We have so, to be very, very careful. Dead right, dead right. Dead That's right. Be careful that don't look up because you see somebody always doing this. That is a commitment to the Lord. They are more committed to what they want the world to see than they are committed to the God above. And we have right. to be very careful of that. And we have to be careful yeah. not to be judgmental. Yeah, yeah. Back yeah. yeah. you judge. have to. Because, you have to. Because you not because they, they, they are so devoted that we must believe yes, that. Yes, you must look at it and think you're committed to yes. yes, mm -hmm. they're doing it for show. You have to be very, very careful. Back and as judgment. a Christian, and I mean I remember a, a couple of a couple of um couple of prayer meetings back, we talk about measuring ourselves by others. We have to be very careful of that. Mm -hmm. Do yes. not measure your faith by what you see from somebody else. Because inside of them, you don't really know what's going on because I all see. you're seeing is the outward part of them. You have to be very, very careful. Word, word, word. Like, like, like the guy driving the, the Benz, but is, you know, seven figures in debt. Mm. You have to be careful. You have to be very careful. We have. Yeah. I think we can go all night, you know. What the <laughs> points have been made. Well, I would sleep off if you're all going all night. <laughs> 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 and it uh, might be embarrassing, but we had an all-night prayer meeting, and for the life of me, I've never been able to justify the, the, the need for an all-night prayer meeting. And so at about two o'clock, my the man's where they where they rented for me to say in Sligoville was near the church. I could walk easily. At about two o'clock, <laughs> I don't stay up that late. As I said to them, I said, Brethren, I am sorry, but um, the leader is going to continue. Your pastor will be going to bed. You know, make some stay there and sleep in a church. No, we, we just walk go down to my house. We tell them, look, I don't stay up this late. I can't stay up that late. I go to I go to bed early. It's only because we have Bible study now while I'm up. I would have been <laughs> in bed an hour ago. <laughs> All right. I, I was not embarrassed. I, I just told them, look, so if they see me walk out, they don't think I'm dissing the fellowship. No, uh, you're, I'm, it's just as, uh, where do I want to fall asleep? In the, cha in the chapel, in the prayer meeting. Oh, that goes right back to where people uh, would say, oh, he's not spiritually enough. Yeah, they could, they could write all night. They and could fire me because I can't stay at an all night prayer meeting. I'm still right. sleeping in my bed. <laughs> you know? All right, brother Clinton, we won't keep you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so, as usual, another good study. Um, we want to remind you next week we is Thanksgiving, so we won't be here next week, Wednesday, God willing um and harvest is this week sunday so you know if you have anything to bring bring it and if you don't have anything to bring you can bring home an offering still. and yeah. still come yes that's right uh sister marva if you don't mind can i ask you to close us off in prayer please sure father we thank you for another night lord of our studying your word lord help us lord that whatever we we'll, we we'll learn tonight lord we may not just put it as faith value we may in planted in our minds and our hearts, Lord, so we can share it with others and that mm -hmm. others may learn from us. Let our lights, Lord, also shine so that others may see Jesus within us, not just on Sundays, but right through the week, Lord. I pray as we leave, Lord, you may guide us through the Thanksgiving week, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you may cover us under your blood so that whatever we do, whatever we do in this holiday season, Lord, it may reflect your will, Guide us all, we pray, as we leave one from another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Have, have, have a good night, everybody. Lord, good night. Yes, my friend. You don't mind staying up five minutes for you can call me. Yeah, man. I, I, I'll buzz you right after we close up. No problem. All right. Good night, all right. everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank 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 you. Th